Well, hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Garrett, and I am going to be the host for today's uh, video or live stream here on professional lighting techniques. Uh, this is the third installment in the series. If you have not yet watched the first two that we have done, uh, those are on the Light Panels website and on their YouTube channel. I'm sure they can throw a link in there. So if you have not yet uh, seen those, do check those out. A lot of the videos we're going to be doing in this series are building on each other. So the techniques that we use in one are going to be used in the rest of them. And that's kind of the way that lighting works in, in the film world is we take the things that we've learned and we apply them as we move forward. So today, as you can tell here uh, from the preview that we just watched, we're going to be talking about how we light car interiors. Uh, specifically for this one, we're going to be doing what is commonly referred to as a poor man's process or a poor man's process trailer. Generally, when we're filming car interiors, cars are on big process trailers with all of the lights and the cameras and they're driving all around. Uh, but if you don't have the budget for that, which of course I didn't either, uh, there are ways that we can use cars and create environments for cars that make them feel as though, you know, they're still operating the way that a car would, of course, without having to have all of that equipment. Uh, so again, you can check the link there. Now, the next one, because we're doing these kind of throughout the year, the next one we're doing is how to uh, light dialogue scenes with multiple people. So if you have not uh, yet registered for the next one, that is also live on that link. So do please register for the next one, because the further we get into this, the cooler the stuff is that we're going to be doing. Uh, now, before we really dive into how we light or how we lit this particular uh, scene, we should, of course, uh, watch the scene. So let's take a look at this short sequence that we put together here, and then we can dive into how we set it up and how we lit it. I'm back units at 4871, 4871 at 211, just occurred, New Jersey and Savannah, New Jersey and Savannah. Suspects are armed with a handgun. They're described as three male Caucasians, all wearing white shirts, blue jeans, one wearing a cap. They were last seen walking southbound on Savannah. Of course, they're not going to lie. Can I point anything to you from Mr. Curry, Savannah? Is that the change of location of the church? Can I point anything to you from Mr. Curry, Savannah? Is that the Title card was there at the end. There's a lot happening here in this scene that we need to break down. Again, if you've watched uh, the previous episodes, there are a couple of principles to how we approach lighting that, like everything, apply to this setup. And of course, the first is that we want to light bright. Uh, this sequence obviously takes place at night. And Oh, there is this misconception within kind of the world of beginning filmmaking and indie filmmaking that if we're filming it to be night, it should be dark because that's how night is. And, and that could not be further from the truth because we're not recreating reality perfectly. That's not our job as filmmakers. Our job is to create an entirely new reality for our audience to live in. So it's not about making night look like how night actually looks it's making night look how night feels and by using emotion to dictate how we approach our lighting strategies we're then going to be able to create looks that are going to be emblematic of the stories that we're telling because lighting like everything else in filmmaking is a layer within the story right the acting the writing the lighting the camera work there's a whole bunch of layers that all go into how a movie makes an audience feel. And so when we are approaching lighting, you always want to light bright. Uh, I tell my film students all the time, whatever your budget is, you should buy the most bright and the most accurate light your budget can afford, whatever that is. And as we're gonna talk about today, that's because anytime you modify a light, you're going to either lose the spread of that light or the intensity of that light. So by lighting bright, we are able to then control the environment that we're in, light the way that we want, and then be able to go through and actually create a scene that is going to feel the way we want our audience to feel. 
if, by the way, at any point throughout this, uh, you have any questions, right? Don't don't worry about saving questions for the end. Uh, there is both the chat and a and a module that I have up over here. So uh, feel free to chime in with any questions that you might have at any point through this. So then that way, of course, we can address things as they come up. And then there will be a Q&A at the end, okay? So feel free to use either of those. Now, going back to this, right? We have this idea of lighting bright. And that way we can expose our camera properly. We're able to not have to lean so heavily on high ISOs and we can then get really clean looking images. The other thing we talk a lot about in this series is this idea of lighting spaces and not faces. When we have super bright lights, we're then able to back those lights up, giving our talent and our camera the freedom to move throughout a scene without having to strike lights and set them up and have downtime because Downtime is the worst thing that we can have on a film set, especially when we're trying to work efficiently. So back the lights up, make sure the lights are bright. Bright lights can be lit for emotion, and that also gives us the freedom to move throughout. Okay, so those are kind of the guiding principles that we're going to be starting with that everything else that we're doing is built on. Okay, so... The lighting style that we are using here is a style called a reverse key light. And what that means is, is that the key light, of course, is the brightest light or the largest source of light in a scene. And a reverse key means that wherever the camera is, the light will be on the opposite side of the talent from the camera, right? So normally, if you have a camera like you guys are looking at me, the key light would be like this, where it's going to be kind of off somewhere on the 30 to 45, maybe 60 degrees uh, from camera, right? And that is generally how we're going to have that and fill on the other side and, and all of those kind of things. But when we're talking about a reverse key light, that key light goes from being here to being all the way on the other side. And the effect of that, and we can show you guys here, the effect of that, of course, is you get almost a silhouette look right so i will pull this up here and you can look at it right like this okay so here our main source of light is coming on the side of our talent that is opposite the camera right camera side of the face is relatively dark and by having this be illuminated kind of coming into here adds a really dynamic lighting style to what very well could feel boring if it's just dark Right. So the first light that we're going to talk about today is the light that we used for this reverse key lighting setup. And that key light that we used is a two by one Gemini soft in a dual array. Now, this is absolutely insane because you can stack two two by ones together and create a single fixture that puts out a massive amount of light. And for this scene, we of course wanted him to feel as though he was in an industrial space. And so we set the gels in our two by one uh, to sodium vapor, which is gonna be those same kind of lights that you would find in a parking lot or in an industrial area. And we used that as our main source of light. So we just put that up as high as we could, shown it down, and you can see here, the effect is it feels as though we're in some form of an industrial area, but it doesn't feel artificial. Now, there's also two things that we should know. One, this is supposed to take place at night, but uh, due to scheduling with the talent and the crew and everything, we had to film it during the day. So with that, we actually needed to then bring the shoot into a garage. So this is a, just a residential garage that we brought the car into and we blacked out all of the windows, doors and everything else to make a you know, dark environment. This was filmed at like noon in the middle of the day where it's super lovely and bright outside. Now, the other thing about filming in a garage is of course a car is covered in windows. So if we're in a garage, and we have bright lights, that means that the environment of the garage is going to be visible through the windows. And we couldn't have that, right? Uh, so what we did is we did a combination of two things. The first, and this is kind of a cool piece here, uh, this is something called dulling spray. 
and dulling spray is sweet because it's temporary it comes off you don't have to you know go through and scrape it off or anything it's a pretty easy thing to do but all it does is as the name would imply is it kind of will frost glass right so the nice thing about this is i could then take this shake the can and spray it on the windshield and then on the far side of the car to then make it so that we couldn't see directly through the windows now, of course, I wanted it to feel like it was raining, right? I didn't want it to feel as though it had just snowed and there's frost all over the car. So the next piece that we did is the trick that's used oftentimes when we're creating sweat on people, right? So if you want somebody to be sweaty on camera, you use a combination and it's about a 50-50 mixture of glycerin and water. Uh, glycerin is a super viscous liquid water obviously isn't but the combination between the two allows water to run a little bit but still kind of hold and stick uh, as opposed to just beating off entirely so we used this combination of glycerin and water after the dulling spray to then break up some of that frosting to kind of give us a little bit more um, in our uneven kind of displacement of that in the background. And you can kind of see here, if we come here, it looks like in the background on the window there that we have rain from the outside, right? That's how it looks in this shot. Even though, of course, because we were in the residential garage, we weren't spraying water anywhere. The effect of the rain is sold between what we did to the window treatment and then just through sound design. Right? By adding the sound of water and by seeing kind of this displacement in the windows, we then believe that it's raining outside, even though, of course, it wasn't, right? So those are kind of two pieces that we did here. We had to film inside during the day. And then, of course, we had to then obscure the windows so that way you didn't then see the garage. But this reverse key, right? Let's talk a little bit about this here. So if we look at a lighting diagram that I've got here, let's go here. Right. So on our 180 degree line is going to be kind of set at about here. Right. So we're only going to be kind of on this half of the of the car. Um, and that's also because the garage door is kind of right here. So we're fairly close up against the garage door. But we put this two by one dual array together to give us a massive source of light that's coming down across the car. So then if we're in the car and we're facing this way or we're kind of here in this shot, no matter where we are going to be pointed, this light is going to be opposite our talent from the camera side. And that's what is going to sell this effect of this reverse key lighting, the super dynamic lighting. Now, two by one is extremely Right. And the nice thing is, is because we had this diffusion over the windows, right, or this obscuring of the windows, we then didn't need to flag off the rest of the garage. And we could actually use that as bounce or reinforcement for our key light. So the ceiling of the garage is white, the inside of the garage door is white. And having this giant light source spraying light across allowed it to kind of come through multiple windows while still being directional and sourcey. So any time you guys are looking to film something that you want to feel very dramatic or very intense, right? We want to kick that key light away from the camera as best we can. And the further away from the camera we kick that light, the more dramatic that's going to feel. So that's the first light, right? That's the way that we worked. We were in a garage during the day for something that's supposed to be outside at night, but using light and the color of light is something that we can use to sell that, right? If this was just white light, or if this was just blue light, it wouldn't necessarily give that same industrial feel. So what we do is because again, we're creating our own reality, we're just gonna flood it with this orange and people are going to have their own life experience to draw from and it's going to make it feel as though we're in an environment that of course is more reflective of the story. Uh, hello to New Zealand and hello uh, to Paris, France. So glad to have you guys. Uh, here okay so that's the first light and you can see in even some of these other shots here like if we play across here the way that that light plays across the face is really 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 pleasing because while it is super intense and super bright you can kind of tell right there on the cheekbone here we're not blown out in any way because we're getting this natural diffusion from inside the car the way that it breaks up so that is our first light okay that is 
the most important light when you're doing a reverse key lighting setup. And we've got a ton of folks in here. I love it. Hi to Canada, Glasgow, Scotland, uh, Germany. Uh, let's see here. Diane asks, uh, with the dual array, does that equal two uh, lamps set in tandem? Yeah, so the cool thing with the dual array is that you can set them up in the bracket and treat them as individual fixtures. So if you wanted to do uh, gradiated lighting, if you wanted to do different effects within the lighting, multicolored lighting, you can do all of that treating them separately. But you can also then connect them via DMX and treat them as a single source light. So depending on how you want to do it, uh, you can either treat them as a single or as two fixtures, uh, just depending on how you have it configured. And of course, like all of the Geminis, uh, they support both hardline DMX as well as wired or wireless DMX. Uh, so depending on how you want to configure that, you can do that however you want. Uh, we got some Philadelphia in the house. We've got the UK going on. We got Abu Dhabi. Uh, man, this is so cool to have you guys all here. Okay, so first light, key light, reverse key. That's where we're at. But we didn't want our subject to be silhouetted entirely, right? So it's one thing to have a key light, but we didn't want our subject to just fall into nothingness and just be silhouetted. We still wanted to understand who this character is in relationship to whatever the larger story would be that would happen after the title card. And so with that, we of course needed to then fill that light in. And again, going back to this idea of lighting spaces and not faces, we needed that fill light to be a wrap on the opposite side of our orange light, but in a way that our camera operator could move in and around the car without casting shadows onto our talent. So this is kind of a, a, an interesting piece here. And we did two things when it came to the fill lights. We used two different fixtures. Uh, both of them were the Gemini one by one soft lights. Uh, and we had two set up. One we had set up just outside of the A pillar right here in front of the car, uh, pointed through that window. And the other we used from behind the car. So you can see here's the A pillar and you can see kind of on the back side there. We put a honeycomb on this front one because we really wanted a direction, make a direction out of that. And then the one in the back of the car, which you can see here, uh, we put on a snap bag and a snap grid or an egg crate on it and pushed it through the rear of the car, which you can kind of see poking through right there. And what that did is that gave us two directions for our lighting and we could control the intensity of each, but then our camera operator is able to move through the scene because we have fill coming from two directions and we wouldn't then cast unnecessary shadows onto our talent. Now, you'll also notice that that light is green. Okay, so in the same way that we gelled the lights with the internal gels for sodium vapor on the outside, we then wanted to contrast that light uh, with our fills. We didn't want to push white light. We didn't want to push just neutral light. We wanted to keep it still very stylized. So for that, we used the HSI settings within the Gemini 1x1 softs, which is the hue, saturation, and intensity. And that gave us the ability to really dial in the perfect color. When you're doing contrasting color work like this, uh, you really want to look at kind of a color wheel. And then what one color is on one side, the opposite end of the color wheel generally is what we would call a contrasting complementary color. So for this, the exact opposite end of the wheel from orange is blue, but just off of that is this kind of cyan green that we wanted to play with. And I didn't want this light to be so bright that it was very apparent and very obvious that we were pushing and filling light. I wanted it just to be enough that we could see details on our subject, uh, but still not so much so that it seemed sourcey. So all of the Gemini lights, the two by one soft, the one by one uh, soft and the one by one hard, which that's the one by one hard there, are all insanely bright lights. But the nice thing is, is that you have the ability to adjust the intensity by a tenth of a percent. So you can go from anywhere from 0.1% all the way to 100% at a tenth percent, which is amazing. So for those, we really only had those pushed, I believe, if I remember correctly, somewhere between like 5 and 7% of that light output. Again, because we just wanted enough to push that in. So if we're if we go back here, uh, to our 
lighting diagram here. You can see here, again, this is our key light, our reverse key here, pointed this way. This is where our main light is coming from. But this is the light that we have pushing through this A pillar. So most of this light is going to be coming through the windshield on the opposite side. And this light is going to be used to kind of illuminate the cheekbone here, the bridge of the nose on the face, and just a way to kind of get a little bit of separation from our subject from just falling into nothingness. Uh, we put a honeycomb on this, which is a really tight grid on this first light here. Uh, because again, I didn't want that light to spill everywhere. I wanted it to be super directional and really just focus on our subject. And again, I didn't need a ton of light. So by having the honeycomb, even though we're going to lose a significant amount in terms of stoppage of our light, I still was able to direct that light exactly where I wanted it to go. Now with the second one over here, we put it in a snap bag, which is a, a soft box. And then I didn't put any diffusion on the front of that. I just wanted it for direction. And on the front of that soft box, I then put uh, a 60 degree snap grid, which is uh, just kind of what we would call an egg crate. Um, and that again was uh, inside the tailgate here, but outside the vehicle. And that was just to push light inside the car, again, primarily focusing on the back of our subject, right? And this is what we would kind of use both as a fill and a backlight, right? Because again, the idea of a fill is to complement the key light while still maintaining contrast. And then a backlight or an edge light, hair light, crown light, rim light, a lot of names for it, is to separate our foreground from our background. So the light that we had in the back of the car was kind of doing double duty, uh, again, giving us that nice wrap across the subject, but at the same time, of course, separating that subject from the background. Okay, we've got more folks here. We've got people from Bulgaria, Spain. Jared asks, what ISO and camera are you using? Was it overlit and brought down in post, or was it that contrasty on the monitor? All very good questions. So going back to this misconception of when we film night, it needs to be dark, could not be further from the truth. We want to light it very bright. And that's because all cameras, regardless of the camera that you're using, have what is called a native ISO, right? Digital cameras, by the way, different for film cameras, but digital cameras all have what's considered a native ISO. And even if you're rocking a camera that has extremely high ISO capabilities, the best looking image that that camera is going to produce is going to be at whatever that native ISO is. So for us and what we were doing in this one, we were filming with the red Komodo. And so native ISO on the red Komodo is 800. And that is where we kept the ISO uh, in camera. And so we needed to make sure that we had enough light that we were able to film at native and then, of course, you know, not need to over crank our ISO or like make the depth of field super, super shallow, because that's the other thing. If we have to open up our lenses all the way, your first AC is going to hate you because they're not going to be able to pull focus well, or you're just not going to be able to achieve critical focus all the time, right? I'm sure you guys have either worked on projects or seen projects from folks who are just starting out and they have this extremely shallow depth of field. I have a 1.8 lens. I have a 1.4 lens. I've got a whatever. And like, it's a razor thin focal plane and it becomes really hard to tell what's going on. So we don't want to have to do either of those things. And that's why we have extremely bright lights. Uh, but Jared, to the second half of your question here, yes, it was lit in a way to be exposed evenly on set and then brought down in post. That's the best way to color grade is to light bright gray dark. Um, and in the monitor, uh, we were using small HD monitors and we were able to toggle uh, preview LUTs and then looking at just the raw video. So most of the feed that I was looking at, I was looking at the low contrast versions just because I like to be able to kind of see the entirety of the image. But if I wanted to check with DIT or see where my exposure values are, I could flip over into a preview LUT that we put in and kind of see generally what that look would look like um, when we're done. So there's that. Hello to Mexico City. I'm so glad you guys are here. Uh, yes, so Sarah asks, uh, did you have the two by ones on full intensity uh, for the reverse key? And the answer to that question is yes. We had both of the two by ones at full intensity because we wanted that to be a very, very overpowering light. 
Uh, and then, of course, the fills we were using uh, very little of because we just wanted to fill in some of those detail elements. Um, Omar said, how can I know if my lighting is fair enough uh, to light the scene? Great question. So uh, there are a couple of ways that you can do it. Uh, the old school method and the way that like I was taught when I first started is, of course, having a light meter and being able to then meter read everything that you've got going on, um, whether that's a spot meter or an ambient reader, doesn't matter. Um, so that's one way that you can do it. But fortunately, in the world of digital, we have a lot more tools on hand than we would if we were shooting film. And so the easiest and most consistent way of being able to achieve critical exposure is with a tool that's built into quality monitors called uh, false color. False color kind of looks like predator vision, where it's just a rainbow of cascading spectrum colors across an image. Uh, but you can then identify what the exposure level is for any given thing within the scene. So it's still a pictorial representation of your image, but it's displayed in a color matrix to let you know exactly where your exposure values are at for each thing that you're looking at. And that is measured in units called IRE. Um, and what you want is you want your exposure for skin tones because that's what we should always be exposing for. If you expose the face nicely, it doesn't matter if your shadows are, are crushed or if your highlights are blown out, you want faces to look their best. And faces look their best somewhere between 60 to 65 IRE. Uh, so when you're looking at a false color readout, there will be a key at the bottom, which will let you know kind of what color identifies which IRE level, and you can set your exposure so then that way skin tones are reading at about 60 to 65 IRE, and then you're absolutely confidently able to shoot knowing that you're going to have the exact exposure that you want. The other nice thing about false color is that it also allows you to check the entirety of your frame to decrease or increase contrast within the rest of your frame as you see fit. So, you know, where zebras will kind of only give you stripes over what is overexposed, with false color, you're able to then see how much something is overexposed, where that is, is it able to be recovered, is it not, and same with the shadows. Um, so I swear by it, all of the small HD monitors have that all built in. They're incredible tools, but whatever it is that you're using, false color, uh, sometimes it's called exposure assist, uh, but they're the same thing. That's the tool that you would use uh, for exposure here. Okay, uh, Bob said, uh, why was the green gel used on the light coming through the back window? It doesn't seem like the color is natural to the street and such could raise a question of credibility to the viewer. Okay, Bob, great question. So uh, circling back to this and we'll look at this here. Okay, So this of course is giving us mostly fill just on the side of the face here. Uh, it is super, super directional because we have a super tight honeycomb on this uh, Gemini here. The issue that we were running into is because we have one light source coming in on this side of the subject and one light source coming in on this side of the subject, everything on the back of our subject was falling into nothingness. So the our, our talent's head was falling into the ceiling of the car, which was making it all look a little bit forced and a little bit staged. We, by the way, are going to go back and look at this little sequence again, so you guys can kind of watch it um, as well. And this is why, of course, we kept it all very dark, because if you're in an industrial environment, right, assuming that, you know, wherever it is that this car is parked, we have a, a key lamp, right, which is this sodium vapor light, but you could have uh, be in a strip mall where you've got different vendors that have different lights. We could be in a parking lot where there are other cars around that are casting light. There's no real sense of direction for any particular lighting. So I wasn't worried about lighting continuity or making that lighting you know, feel as though it's you know, working with another environment. We're just simply creating an entirely new environment for our audience to live in. So this light here is doing double duty, right? Again, it is filling in this side of the face in the same way that this side of the face is getting filled by this light, but then it's also wrapping around this shoulder here so we're treating it almost like a backlight or an edge light just as much as we would be using it as a fill. Uh, okay, so Andre asks, uh, do, 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 hopefully the main street, I don't know about this, L zones. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar, I'll have to look at that here. I have them on a very cam use them. Oh, that's cool. Okay, I'll take a look at that. 
That's sweet. Um, okay, so let's get back to this here real quick because we have one other light uh, that we play with here. And that is a light that we call a Hollywood light. So Hollywooding a light, at least in, in America, uh, simply means that somebody has to physically hold it. So when you hear the term, can you Hollywood this or Hollywood that, um, it just means you have become the light stand. Uh, and so for this final light, we had the police vehicles or the emergency vehicles driving by. So we needed this light to kind of temporarily wash over the face of our subject, but not be constant on a stand. So we needed both the position of the light to move and the intensity of that light to move, which is why we then needed to Hollywood that light. And for that one, we used another Gemini one by one soft and we had a PA hold this light. And so we had to play around to get the exact look that we wanted, both in terms of the direction of how it was pointed and then, of course, how we wanted it to move. And all of the Geminis have effects built into them. And so this is the emergency light effects. And you can kind of see here what that then looks like on the face. And so after some trial and error and figuring out exactly how we wanted it to work, we then could just cue on the set when we wanted that light to kick over, what we wanted the talent to do, and how we wanted it to work. And then again, it's this really subtle effect across the face. Because again, we didn't want the effect to be so prominent that uh, it washes out the rest of the lighting in our scene because the idea again is that the police or whatever emergency vehicles there are are driving by right we have no reference for spatial distance or anything like that but between the sound selling what the effect was and then of course having this pass by of these subtle effects across the face really then is able to dial that in the effects on these lights, by the way, are incredibly customizable. So with the emergency vehicle lights, we're able to not only adjust the intensity, but like which colors are blinking. Uh, what is the speed of that blink? And you know, what is the repetition of those lights that we're having blinking? So we're able to dial in the exact, the exact aesthetic that we want for that effect. And that's true of all of the effects and all of these lights, which are all uh, pretty incredible here. So if we look at this here, you come in here. So again, key light are two fills. And then with that same uh, 40 degree honeycomb that we have on this light, we also put on this light because I didn't need a ton of light, but I did want it to be very directional. And I didn't want to have to worry about a ton of spill washing all over the place as we're trying to operate this light. So putting a tight honeycomb on it made it super directional. And then I'm able to do a walk by or a pass by over and not have the light on, have the light on and then not have the light on and not have to worry about any of that spill. So those are kind of the way that we set up those lights to then get uh, this effect here. Uh, how strong is the Hollywood light? I mean, the nice thing with all of these Gemini's. I mean, even the two by ones. I've I've had the Hollywood two by ones before, but all of these lights are so incredibly light um, that Hollywooding a light like this is is super easy. Um, and the yokes that you get on them can also act as really nice handles. So Hollywooding a light of a fixture that's of this size and weight um, is super 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 simple. And the other nice thing is that all of these lights uh, can be powered by gold mount or v-mount battery as well so uh for the hollywood light that we used in addition to one of the other uh, one by one gemini softs we put a single battery bracket on that and then we're able to power that off of v-mount uh which was great for the hollywood light because then we don't have to worry about tripping over cords as we're kind of walking around and moving around uh the set here uh, Dakota asked, how does the output of the two by one compare to a cob with softbox setup? Is this comparable to something like a 300D, for example? Great question. So the two by one uh, is definitely going to be brighter than a 300D. I have a 300D, I have the two by one. Two by one is absolutely brighter. The biggest difference that you're going to find, though, isn't necessarily the brightness, right? Uh, it, it's much more of the way that the light behaves. So when we talk about the behavior of light, how we want light to act in the way that we have things set up, we generally determine that by the harshness or hardness 
of a light to the softness of the light, uh, which is implied in the naming scheme for the Gemini lights, a one by one soft versus a one by one hard, right? For example, the behavior of that light, even though the fixture itself looks identical, is going to behave differently. And panel lights behave much more differently than chip on board or, or Cobb style, Fresnel style LEDs. And that comes down to two things. One is the surface area of a light. The, the way a light behaves is directly determined by the relative surface area of that light in comparison to the subject. Right, So the larger the surface area of a light is, the softer that light will be. The smaller the surface area of a light is, the more harsh that light will be. Uh, the example that's easiest is that, of course, the sun is a giant source of light, but it is so far away from us that the relative size of the sun, when you look up in the sky, is pretty small. You know, it's, it's that big. Um, whereas, so when you're outside on a bright, sunny day, really hard lines, hard contrast, very harsh lighting because the relative surface area of that light compared to a subject is very small. Now on a cloudy day, it takes that small surface area of light and it scatters that across the entire sky, making the relative surface area of that light much, much, much larger, which is why on cloudy days, it's not harsh lighting, it's very soft lighting. People look very, very good. So the same is true when we're talking about fixture lights. So a Cobb style light or a chip on board style light has a very small surface area for that light source. So the way that that light behaves is gonna be wildly different than even a one by one, which the surface area of this light is going to be massive in contrast to. So when you're looking at lights, the brightness, very important. Accuracy, equally important, but also the way that we want lights to behave. The reason why LED panel lights, and specifically the Gemini lights, are used on so many Hollywood film sets is because DPs love the way that panel lights behave. Not to say that you don't use Fresnel style lights or HMIs or, or Cobb style LEDs or any of those. Like those, all of those types of fixtures serve a purpose, but the reason why panel lights get used so often is because it makes people look really, really good. Um, so brightness of the two by one compared to the 300, the, the panel itself is bigger, but the bigger takeaway between those two is of course the way that those uh, behave. Okay. So again, as we keep going through this, if you guys keep having questions, throw them in the chat, throw them in the Q and A. I would love to kind of keep getting into that here. So those are the lights that we used, right? Those are the, the, the different setups that we have here. And so I wanted to look at a couple of these and we can kind of see how they play here. Okay. So in this setup here, obviously we have our big key coming down this side here. And on this part of the frame, we have a whole lot of darkness. Same with the ceiling here. Same with this, right? This is why we had the two by one dual array set at 100% because we really wanted to have this intense contrast but if i pinch to zoom in here and i don't know what the difference between my screen and your screen is what you're seeing here uh, but we have a really nice fill coming across the back of our subject's head here which is separating the head here from the background we're catching it in the ear here as well and that's all coming from the light that's behind our subject and then on this side of the bridge of the nose here on the cheekbone and then of course in the eye and eye socket here, we're then getting that front fill, which again, neither of these lights draw attention away from our key, but they do a great job in giving us a little bit of contrast because if we lost our subject's eye here, for example, or the ear here, or even the subtle separation that we have back there, and we just had the front or the key light in our reverse configuration, our audience wouldn't necessarily gain the same connection with the subject that we would want. This is kind of more uh, going into cinematography land here than lighting, but they're so intrinsically tied together. Uh, humans look for eyeballs. That's what we are always doing, uh, just as a species of, of thing. So when we're talking about film, 
and how we want to film stuff and how we want to light stuff, we want to make sure that the audience can see eyeballs because that's the thing that helps audiences connect with subjects or with characters in our movies, right? This is where we talk about things like catch lights, right? Catch lights are reflective lights that we see in the eyes and that helps make people feel alive. We don't necessarily have catch lights. Uh, people have a tendency to seem dull or, or dead, right? They don't look their best. Uh, the same is true with narrative work. If we don't have a way of connecting with our subject and seeing the eyes of our subject, our audience isn't going to connect with them. They're going to seem uh, vacant. They're going to seem unapproachable. And storytellers can use this to their advantage too, especially when we're talking about villains uh, or antagonists within stories. You know, you do the opposite because you want to pull the audience away or separate them from that subject. But generally speaking, you always want to be able to easily identify and distinguish eyes. That's hands down something that is so crucial in the way that we light, even like in this instance where we're lighting something uh, dynamically, right? Uh, we'll look at one more here. So then again, here, right, we have our reverse key, which is behind us, and you can see it kind of be here and here. This is where we're getting all of that nice background separation, which is coming through that window. And then, of course, you can see here the treatment that we did to obscure the window. We're not then looking at a stand and a garage door and you know a bunch of other things that we would normally see if we were just looking through a window. Uh, so that separation is really nice. But then you can see here that the green light that we have kind of coming onto the foreground here, catching the ears and just a hair back here, right? Is still very present. We're still exposed well for our subject. But again, there's no question that the main source of light is behind them okay and then again if we pinch in here and you look at the eyes right we very can easily identify our subject's eyes and we do have these nice catch lights in the eye which again makes our subject feel more present more alive than they otherwise would okay so it's not a difficult setup but you know it's something that we definitely needed to work through because if we were filming outside, we could back the lights up further, we could bring the sodium vapor light up much higher in that, that two by one dual array, it, we'd be able to expand that scene even further and be able to film outside the car shooting into the car, we'd be able to actually use rain, right, we'd have a lot of freedom with that. Um, but by having the constraints of having to be in a garage, we'd still need to utilize the same principles, right? That's why, for instance, this entire scene takes place inside the car, right? The camera never breaks out of the vehicle. All of the exterior stuff is what we would call an open frame. It's assumed. It's off camera. We're hearing the sirens. We're hearing the rain. We're hearing all of the rest of what's happening in the world. We're just not seeing any of it, right? So we open our frame. We allow the audience to experience the world through sound design and we're filming within the car, kind of in a variety of, of different areas here, okay? So with that, I wanna go through and I wanna look at this sequence again. That way you guys can... No. Maybe, yeah, okay, cool. All right, so let's watch this again real quick here and then uh, pay attention to the way that this is lit and put together, right? So now that you know where all of the lights are, now that you know that there's no rain, now that you know that we're inside, right? Now that you know how it's all put together, when we watch this again, I want you to pay attention to it. I want you to be able to see it. And the way that then you're going to see this scene is going to be much different than the first time you viewed it. And it's going to be absolutely different than how an audience would view it, because an audience isn't going to dissect things in the same way that filmmakers do okay so let's watch this again real quick all back units in 4071 4071 at 211 just occurred new jersey and savannah new jersey and savannah suspects are armed with a handgun they're described as three male caucasians all wearing white shirts blue jeans one wearing a cap they were last seen walking southbound on savannah if 
feels more staged, right? Now that you know where everything is. It feels more obvious now that you know how everything is set up. It definitely doesn't look the way that real night looks, but that doesn't matter. That's not what we're creating. The next time you watch a movie or you watch a show or you watch any of the stuff that you like, assuming that it's of you know, a certain caliber or whatever, the same is true across the board. If you start to actually dissect the way things are lit, uh, it is in no way a reflection of reality. Uh, even in this uh, phase that we're kind of going through of everybody wants to shoot in natural light, natural light it does not mean available light. That's, that's uh, two very different things. You are still going to be modifying and adjusting and enhancing whatever the lighting environment that you are in to achieve that natural look. And the reason for that is because your brain is always lying to you. It's giving you the most pertinent information and it's giving you to you in the best possible terms, right? So, uh, you know, when you are in a public place and you're seeing a bunch of people, it's like, oh, hey, you all look great, right? The second you pull a camera out and you just start filming what's available, you'll see that the camera doesn't lie in the same way that your brain does. And reality or natural light actually looks pretty bad on most people most of the time. What people are talking about when they talk about natural lighting is that they don't want it to look sourcey. They don't want it to look like studio lighting. They want it to look completely blended in, like, like you would not pay attention or notice it. That's all that means. It doesn't mean that we're not bringing lights in. It doesn't mean that we're not scrimming lights or that we're diffusing lights or that we're adding lights or bringing in negative fill, right? There's a lot of ways that we can adjust light but shooting natural light and shooting available light are two wildly different things. And if you're doing narrative work where you have control over the environments that you're working in, there should never be a scenario where you're not adjusting, modifying, adding, or removing light in that environment. Documentary gets a little different because you don't have as much control. But for stuff like this, it's not about recreating reality perfectly. It's about creating a new reality for our audience to live in. Okay, so quick recap, and then we'll open it up to Q and A. So if you have questions, feel free to toss those in here. Okay, so real quick recap: we've got four sources that we're using here, four fixtures that we're using here. The two by one and the dual array is awesome. And side note on this: um, with the, all of the Gemini products, uh, you can get it in just a single fixture like this. You can do a dual array all the way up to a quad array for both the one by one and two by one Geminis, which means effectively you have an insane range in terms of the surface area of the lighting that you're putting out. The same is true for the accessories. Native accessories are made for all the Gemini lights in any of their configurations, which means I could put a softbox and a honeycomb or an egg crate or diffusion or whatever on a two by one configuration. I could do it on a, a, a four or a quad configuration, right? I'm able to have on light modifiers for any configuration of the Gemini lights, which is just bananas. Okay, so for this, this was our main one. We didn't have any modifiers on it. That was just our key light. Uh, the modifiers that we were used is how we diffused these windows, right? That's what then gave us the modification to this light source here. We had our two uh, fill lights, which were the one by one softs. And this guy had that same 40 degree honeycomb on it. And this guy had the uh, snap bag or the uh, soft box and the egg crate on that one as well. And then when we Hollywood this light, uh, that's that same 40 degree honeycomb as on this one, uh, but that one just has the effect built into it, okay? So lighting bright, grading dark, right? That's number one, lighting spaces and not faces, right? That's the other. And then when we want to film dynamic lighting, we want to make sure that the camera is always on the shadow side of our subject, wherever that is. And the more you kick that key light out, the more dramatic that becomes until you get all the way to something like this, which is what we would call reverse key lighting. Okay. So that's how it's set up. That's how it works. Uh, if I was going to 
actually film this at night and we were actually going to be outside the way that we originally planned the lighting setup would stay the same the biggest difference would be those lights would be backed off of the car further and elevated a little bit higher to give us even more freedom to move in and around the car uh, but the principles are entirely the same for all of those uh, can we take a look at the ungraded footage, please? Yes, Eric, we can. Let me pull that up for us here so that we can kind of see just how bright uh, it actually was when we were filming it. Give me a second here, I'll do that. Um, do you have any reflection issues with the glass? Great question. Uh, so when we're talking about reflections, there's a couple of tools that we have. One, the thing that every DP uh, or first AC or anybody in the camera department should have are polarizer filters. Uh, polarizer filters exist for the sole purpose of cutting out or cutting off reflections. Um, so that's something that's going to be done by the camera department more so than the lighting department. But if you don't have a polarizer filter yet, that's far more important than any sort of diffusion or effects filters or anything that you have. You should have neutral density and you should have polarizer. That's number one. Um, number two also then, of course, comes to lighting placement. If any of you have had the pleasure of filming folks who wear glasses, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? Depending on where those lights are in relationship to where the camera is will determine, you know, where the reflections off of those glasses come from. So elevating lights helps a lot. And then, of course, again, kicking lights out around our subject and kind of a dynamic lighting setup like this. Uh, that's going to be uh, the best ways to avoid that. But polarizer filters, hands down, are going to be the most crucial tool to doing uh, that there. Okay, so ungraded footage real quick here. Let me pull some of this up. Uh, okay. Oh, by the way, uh, I am going to be posting about this and doing side-by-sides of the graded footage and ungraded footage on my Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is just my name, so it's just at Garrett Sammons. So if you guys want to see that, I will be posting that today. Um, this little, there's a little bit of a sequence that I teased on there that's on my Instagram now, but the rest of it uh, you guys will be able to see here in a little bit. I'll just put that username here. So do follow me if you, oh good, they put that in the chat there. Do follow me. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, things that you guys would like to talk about, that's a great way to get in touch with me. Uh, you can also do that through the uh, sign up page with light panels. So signing up for the next one um, is going to be super important because again, the further we get into this, the cooler this stuff is going to get. Um, so far, we've done interview lighting, which is a super important thing that all filmmakers should know how to do uh, because whether or not you get into docu work, corporate work, uh, or narrative work, understanding how to film people, that's important. Uh, the second one was how we film night exteriors. So there are some similarities to this, but it's a much bigger environment and we are outdoors. So that was that one. Uh, this one, of course, is the interior of cars. And then the next one we're doing is a multi-person uh, dialogue sequence. So we're talking about how do you like three people who are in the same room at the same time where we're going to see all three of them. Um, so that's going to be the next one. So if you want to do make sure that you register for that. Uh, there, Eric, it seems as though my ungraded footage is on the only computer that I don't have hooked up to this live right now. I've got three hooked up to this and one over there, and it's on that one over there. So um, I will post that today. I'll do that right after the live stream here. So if you guys want to do the side by side of the graded and ungraded stuff, I'll put that up on uh, my Instagram there. Other comments, questions or concerns, whether they are about process, whether they're about fixtures, whether they're about lighting in general, stuff you guys would like to see. Uh, now is a good time to do it. We've only got a couple of minutes left here before we have to wrap this. So if you have questions, now is the time to do that. Um, the light panels team just put in the link for the next session. Again, please do register for that because that's uh, going to help this thing all get fired and, and moving forward. Also, uh, feel free to send me suggestions of things that you guys want to learn about. How do we light X, Y, or Z, right? I want to know what you guys want to talk about, and that way we can kind of tailor this to you guys and what you guys are doing, okay? Um, last couple of things I'm going to talk about here uh, while you guys all type the last year questions. Of course, with the light panels, lights, there's kind of a family of lights, and my advice always to everyone is buy the lightest, brightest, most accurate light that your budget can afford, right? So whether it is a two by one fixture, a one by one fixture of the Gemini's, 
those are unbelievable lights. I use them all the time. But if those are not yet attainable for your budget, uh, fantastic lights that Light Panels does make are the Astra lights. So there's a line of panel lights from Light Panels uh, called the Astras, and there's a whole family of them. They're all a little bit different. Uh, some of them are by color, some of them are by focus, some of them are soft lights, uh, but they're all insanely bright lights, and they're all insanely accurate lights. And the nice thing with these is that even though they are only by color or white light, um, it's really easy to gel these because you can just put a one by one gel over the top of it. And because these are panels, you don't have to worry about heat uh, ruining them. So if you're not yet at a spot where the Gemini's make sense, I do use the Astras a lot um, when I'm doing kind of more traditional lighting setups that don't require like effects or, or gels or that kind of thing. Um, but there's that. The other one is kind of their, their starter deal. This is the Lycos Plus, um, which if you look at the difference between these two, by the way, you'll notice that they're using the same lenses and the same lensing array. Uh, this is just kind of a quarter of the size of, of that one. Um, but these ones can be powered just off of uh, NPF or Sony L batteries here on the back. They're also by color uh, and have intensity uh, one to 100, a whole bunch of quarter 20 mounts. Uh, including a, a cold shoe on one side here. So these lights are super good for like run and go on the on the road stuff. So if I'm flying, like I these are super easy to pack into something. Um, but again, that's kind of like the the way that you would start if you wanted something small and portable, and then work your way up to kind of these larger fixtures there. So depending on where you are in your filmmaking journey, and where your budget is, uh, you have kind of a range at which you can kind of grow into different lighting fixtures. Okay. Uh, okay, so if there are no other comments, uh, questions, or concerns, uh, we're going to call it here. Again, quick reminder, do register for the next one. We're talking about how to light a dialogue scene. Again, a narrative scene, not, not a documentary style scene, a, an actual narrative scene for filmmakers. Um, so register for that. I will see you guys in the next one. And if you guys missed the first two, those are on that light panels uh, landing page there. So you guys can go back and watch the ones that we have done previously to that. Uh, so have a wonderful time. Thank you so much. Thanks to light panels for letting me do this. This is a super cool thing that we get to do. Uh, register for the next one and I will see you all next time.